Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, starting off the same as I always do, I want to encourage everyone to uh, continue to pray for each other. Uh, I still miss y'all very much. Um, uh, I noticed this week that the, the chat line slowed down just a little bit, and I mentioned it on there, and uh, to, I was worried about y'all, but uh, a lot of y'all responded back and told me y'all were doing good, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Y'all please continue to pray for each other, pray for our country, pray, pray uh, for those that, that, that have this uh, disease and all that's going on. Um, I think things are getting better, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I know that some of the, uh, the uh, services have started back on a smaller scale and whatnot, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But uh, guys, tomorrow... Is Memorial Day, and you know a lot of uh, a lot of people confuse Memorial Day with Veterans Day, and um, Memorial Day is when we remember those who have given their life for this country. And uh, I want to be the first to tell you uh, I love this country. Um, I respect the men and women who serve in the military. Um, tomorrow, when everybody's grilling out or uh, getting together however they can um, there's families that are going to be remembering those that have loved ones that they've lost that have fought for this country and um, if you remember this country was founded on religion the freedom of religion and being able to um, worship the way that we want to worship and um, <clears throat> that's very important to me and uh, I know here lately, it seems like we haven't been able to do that. And, you know, this past week, uh, the president sent out an executive order saying that church is essential and to open churches back up. And I want to clarify that just a little bit. Um, believe it or not, there are some state governments in this country that do not want this country to to thrive. They do not want this country to succeed for some reason. I don't know. And I'm not going to do the church politics thing. I don't do that. But he gave that uh, order because there are some state governments that have physically closed their churches. Praise the Lord we live in a state where our government did not do that. They did not close our churches. What did happen was uh, our government asked us as pastors and as congregations to be um, mindful of what was going on, um, to, to think about our congregation and to be wise in the way that we handled everything. But nowhere, nowhere in time in the state of Mississippi were our churches closed by the government. And um, I'm just so, so thankful um, that we do have Christian leadership <coughs> that, that allowed that for us. Um, so... Uh, with that being said, this morning, I want to look at uh, some instances in the, uh, here in the Bible where worship was actually denied. And to, to uh, set the backstory for this, <coughs> go ahead and if you would turn to uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. So the backstory on this is uh, the Israelites... You know, if you go through the Bible, if you read from cover to cover in the Bible, you'll see that the Israelites have hills and valleys, hills and valleys. They'll go uh, three or 400 years worshiping God, doing what they're supposed to do, putting God first, and then uh, they'll turn their back on the Lord. They'll quit worshiping Him, just uh, start worshiping idols. And what, what happens? Well, the Lord comes and He either, uh, He does something to get their attention. Usually, He'll get another nation to come and, and conquer them and put them into slavery and uh, take away all that stuff that had, had hindered them from worshiping him and get their mind back straight. So what's happened here <coughs> is very familiar. It's a, a old passages. Everybody is, I'm sure everybody's heard the, the stories about these four young men. But there's four young men uh, from Judah and... Uh, once again in history, the, the, the Israelites were not doing what the Lord wanted them to do. So he sent in another nation to conquer them. 
Well, these four individuals, these four young men were captured, and that was the thing back then. You know, once once the, the other nation was defeated, they would take slaves and bring them back and, and use them in their home, you know, back to their home to their home country. So these four young men were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now Daniel, that was his real name. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had Hebrew names, but they were given Babylonian names, which were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now how through the years and the, and the uh, in the writing of the history, did Daniel get to keep his name? I don't know, but I'm glad I don't have to try to pronounce his uh, his Babylonian name. So anyway, <clears throat> so these these young men they come, they not only could not go to their temple and worship on on the Sabbath, but they were removed from their entire country. Okay, so they go and they're 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 over there and. The Lord's blessing. They, they, they are good, godly men, young men, and, and they're worshiping God. Even though they're not at their temple and they're not uh, in their country, they're still worshiping God. All right? So what happens is they do well. And not only do they just do well, but they are starting to be elevated in the government. And they are being put over other people of the home, that home country. All right? So... What usually happens uh, when you think you're overlooked at work or something like that, right? So let's start with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are they are put in uh, uh, they are put over these these other uh, countrymen, and they those other countrymen get jealous because here's some the foreigners are being brought in and they're being put over us. So <clears throat> the the king. Gives the King Nebuchadnezzar gives this order. He says, "All right, when all this bunch of instruments play, I want you to worship uh, this image that I've made. Now, you can only worship that image. You can't worship any other god or whatever. You cannot do anything but worship that image when you hear these music play." <clears throat> so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they never waver. They never stop worshiping the Lord. Well, the guys that they are over notice this, and oh, I'm telling, I'm going to tell Daddy. So they go back to the king and say, "Look, those three men, those three guys that you came in, those foreigners that you brought over, they they're he, they're not doing what you said. Every time the music plays, everybody's worshiping the image, but they're not." <clears throat> so King Nebuchadnezzar gets really angry, and in Daniel chapter three, verse thirteen, he says. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? <clears throat> now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear all this music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? So, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your, out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <clears throat> so they are unwavering in their worship of God. Even in the midst of death, they're unwavering. And I know what you're sitting there saying. Why don't we have church then? How come, how come we're not having church if the Lord protects Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He's going to protect us too. Just hold on. So, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, and their caps, their other clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew these men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So hot that the guys that carried them up there to throw them in died. 
All right. So they throw them in there. And then in verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace, blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, your servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then they came out in the midst of the fire. Let's verse, we'll go on down, verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants, who have put their trust in him. Conversion experience, I imagine. Uh, I believe they had revival right there on the spot. So, let's go to the next guy. If you would, turn over a couple pages to Daniel chapter 6. All right, Daniel was another one of those young men that had been brought in. This is later on. Uh, there's actually a new king of the land. Uh, remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they're not in their home country. They're not, they cannot go to their temple or their church. They cannot worship the way that they want to worship, but they continue to worship God. All right, let's go. So the same thing happens to Daniel. Um, what they did, the, the King Darius, he created... Uh, divisions and uh, like 120 uh, satires or satra I can't y'all have to read it uh, just uh, 120 officials and uh, over those 120 officials each one had uh, that he had three um, other governing officials and one of those was Daniel so again these guys are jealous here's a, here's a guy that that was a slave from a foreign country that they have brought in and have put over him. so they tried to trick Daniel they tried in every way to find something that he did wrong so they could bring it to King Darius to get him in trouble, and they couldn't find anything. The only thing that they found that he did was three times a day he would pray to God, and he would go to his upstairs room, open his window facing Jerusalem, his home country, his hometown. He would go and, and face Jerusalem, the direction of Jerusalem, and pray three times a day. So they said, that's the only way we can catch him. He is so committed to his God that that is the only way we can get him. Think about that. All right. So what they did is they went to King Darius and said, hey, I want you to sign a decree that uh, for the next 30 days, no one can pray to any other being but you. Nobody can pray to God. Nobody can pray to anything. Only to you, King Darius. And uh, he's like, hey, that sounds like a good deal. So he signed it. And there's the, the, when the king, there's a law that if, when a king signs that edict, there's no changing it. Now, he really, really, really liked Daniel. He loved Daniel. That's why he put him in a, such a high position. He had no idea of the trickery going on in his country. Let that sink in just a minute. All right. So he had no idea of the trickery going on in his country. So he uh, he signs this edict, and of course, Daniel never stops worshiping the Lord. He never stopped worshiping the Lord. Okay. So what happens is he goes up there, starts praying, and now here goes those 120 men. Hey, Daddy, look what he's doing. I'm going. I'm telling. I'm telling. Look, look. So they bring uh, Daniel before King Darius. And um, in verse, chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed, and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until the sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. He didn't want to kill Daniel. He, he, he realized that he's been tricked, but he has signed that thing, and by law, it cannot be changed. He has tried every way to get Daniel out of this. All right? So, uh, verse 15. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Verse 16. 
Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel. So he put the uh, stone in and he sealed it, a wax-type seal, so that if anybody broke that and tried to rescue him, they would know that uh, somebody from the outside had tried to get him. All right, verse 18, Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and not enter no entertainment was brought before him. And his sleep fled from him. He was so worried about Daniel. He didn't have, he didn't have lunch. He didn't have supper. Nothing. He just sat in his room, worried about Daniel all night. <clears throat> all right. Then the king rose. Verse nineteen. The king arose at dawn and at break in the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to, to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut their, the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him and also towards you, O king. I have committed no crime. So the Lord protected Daniel. And uh, if you'll keep reading the rest of the chapter there, uh, it didn't turn out so good for the guys that tried to trick him. Because y'all keep, keep reading that. And uh, see what happens when you try to uh, falsely accuse people of something. So anyway, so we have these four young men who never stopped worshiping the Lord. And, um, and we look at that and we say, the Lord protected them. Why, 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 why did we ever stop having church? Why, why he would protect us too? And you know what? Our faith is strong, and um, the Lord does protect us. He protects us every day. But at the same time, I can sit here and quote you scripture after scripture, where the Lord says, you know, to 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 be cautious, not to test Him. Um, you know, Proverbs, it says, a fool can shorten his days by doing, doing stupid stuff. And <clears throat> we've tried to be cautious. Um, you know, we, we, we haven't had service, not because I didn't want to come to church. Uh, I, I, I would hate to see a pastor that did not want to come to church and worship. But um, out of love of our congregations, uh, some pastors and deacons, and other congregation members have had to make some hard decisions, uh, not because we didn't want to have church, but because we love our members. Um, you know, I heard a, a, a analogy this week. You know, you have faith in God, but you wear your seatbelt, don't you? You know, uh, you look both ways before you cross the street. Uh, you, you know, I can go on and on. But he told us to be cautious. Our, uh, our government asked us to be cautious, and we have. And um, uh, it's hard. It's really hard. Uh, I'm sitting here in this empty, in this empty church, and uh, it's hard. But guys, it's gonna get better. I promise. Um, you know, just like the Israelites, every so often the Lord came and He got their attention. And guys, I believe that uh, the Lord's got our attention now. Um, we have forgotten. You know, I grew up in a, in a society when I was a child where uh, if you wanted something on Sunday from the store, you better buy it on Saturday. If you needed gas on Sunday, which you usually didn't because you stayed home, you better get it on Saturday. Nothing was open on Sunday. Um, ball practice was unheard of on Sunday. Uh, when sporting events, whether it be school or recreational, was scheduled around church, you had nothing on Wednesday nights because everybody was at church. You had no practices on Sundays because everyone was at church. Uh, stuff in the summer was usually um, scheduled around youth trips. <laughs> Look at our world today. Most of the time, <clears throat> there's 
the 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 football stadiums are full on Sundays. The NASCAR tracks are full on Sundays. Basketball, whatever. Um, the travel ball nowadays. Uh, we're teaching our kids that church is optional if you have something more important to do. And if I step on some toes with that, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Uh, where is worship in our perspective now? You know, just a few months ago, we may wake up on a Sunday, be a pretty day like today, and go, you know, it's so pretty today, I believe I'll stay home. Or you know it's been a rough week this week. I believe I'm going to stay at home today and just kind of relax instead of going to church this morning. Well, the last few months you haven't been able to do that, have you? We haven't been able to get up and go on Sundays. How's that feel? Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Guys, I am a firm believer that the Lord has got our attention. And when we get back together, and start worshiping together again as a church family. I believe it's going to be a great thing. I believe our worship is going to be a whole lot different. I believe we're going to be a whole lot more involved. I believe that we're going to be a whole lot more focused. And with that being said, um, guys, we're going to try to tentatively uh, try to have some drive-in service the first Sunday in June. Um, well, Brother Chad, why can't we just come? We can, we can do the sanctuary. and Well, guys, we're too small. Uh, even if we came in here and sat in, in family groups that have been quarantined together and skipped every other pew, we can't fit. We can't fit, and that's a good thing. <laughs> that is a great thing. Um, there's been some churches that have, have gone back that are, that are smaller than we are that uh, they're, 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 they can actually fit in there six feet apart. Well, uh, and that being said, our insurance says that uh, as long as we follow the uh, recommendations from the CDC, we're covered. Well, there's no way we can do that in the sanctuary. But I do want us to start getting back together and visiting with each other from the distance and having service. So tentatively, the first Sunday in June, and I'll let you know more about it because there's some stuff that has to be done, some equipment that has to be moved and whatnot, and we're going to try to get all that set up. So the first Sunday in June, we're going to try to have drive-in services and uh, weather permitting. We'll have to check on that. But guys, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, and remember, where are your priorities? Has, has, has God really uh, uh, made you understand where our priorities lie? Has he got your attention with this? He has mine. Uh, and I pray, I pray nothing like this ever happens again. But at the same time, this is going to sound awful. But I am thankful that he has made us focus on what is important and how much we love him. It's a, it's a, when, you, when you can't wake up on Sunday mornings and go to that church that you love, wherever it is, you understand the perspective of how important it is for his people to get together and worship him. I love each and every one of you. Please call me if you need anything. Uh, and if, if you're listening to this and you're not a member of my church, pray for your pastor. It's, it's hard on us. Um, very hard not to come together with our congregations. Uh, it's very hard to do, and I hate to say a job because it's not a job. You know, The Lord called us to do this. But it's hard for us to do our job when we can't see each other. We can't, you know, get... Uh, that close we can't go visit each other's houses we can't do any of that so all we can do right now is rely on social media and messaging and calling so if you need anything please call if i can help you in any way please call if you need me to pray for you please call hey if you want to know more about jesus and want to accept him as your lord and savior by all means call text message whatever i am never too busy to talk to someone about jesus love y'all keep praying See you soon.